Hi, I'm John Barry. I'm a partner at Munger Tolls and Olson down in Los Angeles. And my big thought for this conference has to do with COVID-19 and insider trading. Look, there are a ton of reasons out there for people to want to try and sell stock these days. And so my advice for anyone advising public companies or working in-house at public companies is to make sure the employees at those companies know the rules about insider trading. I spent quite a bit of time at the SEC, and one thing I know for sure is the SEC will be looking very carefully at how people are trading stock these days. So that's my advice, and I look forward to talking to everyone at the conference. Welcome back. Our next panel focuses on the use of big data, AI, and the role of technology in investigations. It's a critical topic, not only because it changes every year, but because the SEC has made extraordinary strides in this area, and we all need to keep up in order to remain successful. So moderating the panel is someone who's known to pretty much everyone working in Silicon Valley. Nikki Locker is an expert in securities litigation and shareholder lawsuits, leads the securities litigation practice at Wilson Sonsini with a list of blue chip clients that's a mile long. Nikki's been at Wilson Sonsini for 34 years and has represented companies and their officers and directors in more than 100 shareholder class actions and derivative lawsuits in venues throughout the United States. Welcome, Nikki. Thank you. Uh, next up, I want to introduce Tracy Davis. Uh, been at this conference many times. It's always a pleasure to have Nick, uh, Tracy with us. She's an assistant director in the San Francisco office, uh, who used to be an assistant director in the FCPA group. Um, during her almost two decades at the SEC, Tracy's worked on countless investigations, litigations, and administrative proceedings, and she has experience collaborating with U.S. agencies and regulators, including the DOJ, FTC, FDA, FBI, U.S. Attorney's Office, as well as foreign regulators in numerous countries. So thank you again for being here, Tracy, and thanks for your dedication to the SEC. Welcome. Uh, Brett Coombe is our next panelist. Brett is a senior managing director in FDI Consulting's Forensic and Litigation Consulting Practice based in Portland. Brett is your classic financial expert, be it accounting, auditing, or forensics. Brett's near 25 years of experience says it all. Uh, what's never been more true nowadays is you really can't be a successful financial expert without understanding the use of technology, data analytics, AI, and the rest. And uh, it's great to have Brett with us. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Bruce. And thanks for continuing to host this during these unique times. Thank you, Brett. And finally, the last speaker on the panel uh, could have probably the most interesting job of anyone speaking here today. Uh, Nick Lewis is Regulatory and Investigations Counsel at Google which includes responding to regulatory inquiries involving Google's products and businesses in over 60 countries. Uh, we're really grateful that Nick was willing to uh, take the time to be here today. Welcome, Nick. Thanks very much, Bruce. Happy to be here. Um, delighted to have this panel. It's a great topic and changes every year. Nikki, uh, let me turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I'd like to start with Tracy. Um, and Tracy, I, I thought maybe you could tell us about the SEC's use of AI or data, data analytics to identify potential misconduct. And maybe what we should do is start with insider trading, uh, which is where I understand the SEC um, certainly uses AI and data analytics to identify potential um, areas of improper insider trading to focus on. So would um, would you tell us about that? Sure, and thanks, Nikki. Um, yeah, you know, when I started the commission nearly 20 years ago, um, it really was a, a more manual process in terms of trying to identify potential uh, insider trading. We would look at what are called blue sheets, which were uh, records of traders that are uh, trades that occur at, at brokerages. And so, at that time, it was just a manual process. Now with just the sheer number of, of trades that go through our markets on a daily basis, it's almost impossible to do that in a manual way. So the SEC does use um, AI and, and data analytics to, in a, in a more quicker 
um, technological process identify anomalous trades. It might be relationships um, because oftentimes traders are trying to um, to uh, conceal their identity, conceal their relationships with other traders if they're tipping others, um, if they're working in some kind of trading ring. So the the SEC's data analytics and their AI is has become really sophisticated in identifying either, first of all, anomalous trades. So you might see a particular trader who is frequently trading right in front of an announcement by a particular issuer, or they might be trading in a particular industry and the, ti- and the trading of the, t- of the, the timing of the trading is often suspicious. Um, and so we use the technology to identify either anomalous trades or anomalous relationships and we put all that information together, which gives us leads on who to pursue in terms of potential misconduct. It sounds as if um, using uh, these technology tools, the SEC can actually advance its investigations and insider trading cases pretty far along before even reaching out and issuing subpoenas, et cetera, by use of just tying things together through use of the artificial intelligence or the um, data analytics. Is that correct? That's exactly right. And, and you know, with insider trading, um, we want to do as much investigative work covertly as possible. Um, sometimes you have traders who um, live in the U.S., but maybe they have citizenship elsewhere. So there's always a concern about, about individuals fleeing. So you want, once they become aware of your investigation, so to the extent that we're able to identify either, like I said, uh, relationships among traders, um, anomalous trades amongst them, when we're able to develop all that information covertly before they're even aware that we're investigating, it allows us to be prepared if, in fact, for example, they're going to flee. Maybe there's a parallel investigation with the Department of Justice. We can develop a lot of information about the potential misconduct and then be prepared to to either file emergency action, to freeze assets, to freeze bank accounts prior to um, to us actually surfacing. Wow, that's great. Okay, I'm going to turn to Nick. Um, and Nick, before I actually, I'm going to ask you about Google's use of um, AI and data analytics. I'm sure that those in the audience are would be very interested to hear about the Google's, the internal investigative structure within Google, and then where you fit within that. And then we'll dive into artificial intelligence and data analytics. Thanks, Nikki. That sounds good. First, um, I just wanted to say thank you to to you for inviting me to participate and to my fellow panelists, and as well to Bruce and Security Stock and everyone that put this on. I think it's um, pretty great that we were able to come together on this forum under the circumstances. And I hope everybody out there who's watching is doing as well as possible under these strange times. Um, The second thing I wanted to throw out there really quickly is a a quick disclaimer that the views that I'm going to express are my own and not necessarily those of Alphabet or Google. I'm sure you all have heard similar disclaimers throughout the day, but just wanted to get that out there. Um, But with that, Nikki, to your question, So I'm on the regulatory and investigations team, which is within the Google legal department. Um, We are, as Bruce mentioned at the outset, obviously a very large company. We have offices in over 60 different countries. We have over 100,000 employees. Our products and services um, are quite varied and, um, you know, raise lots of different, um, you know, interesting legal issues and things of that nature. So what my team does is the name regulatory and investigations kind of encapsulate it, encapsulates it. On the regulatory side of things, our team um, will become involved in responding to regulatory inquiries from regulators all around the world. Um, quite often, we'll do so in partnership with other legal teams or other policy teams or um, a cross-functional group of people across the company reaching out to people to, to obtain the information, information necessary to, to respond. Uh, we also have a, a great discovery legal team that, that we work with a lot on that as well. Um, so obviously that's quite the big uh, and interesting task to cover all of our products and services in that way. And then on the investigation side of things, um, there are a number of different investigations teams at Google that conduct uh, internal investigations of some kind. 
Um, some are more formal, um, some are less formal. And um, what our team does is we, we will handle some significant internal investigations. We may partner with or consult with other investigations teams on significant matters. And we're also charged with um, sort of promoting some best practices and providing a bit of a oversight because we do work with so many different teams to kind of promote sort of uh, the best process possible and, and be consistent in terms of the investigations we conduct. So uh, it's great. an interesting job. Yeah, great. Okay. And can you tell us about how Google uses artificial intelligence, data analytics, both um, it'd be it'd be very interesting to hear about both in the investigative side as well as dealing with external threats and how the artificial intelligence intelligence tools works better and and why you would use it in particular circumstances either with respect to investigations or combating external threats. Right, and that's a great question. I think it's been fascinating uh, for me at the company to see. Obviously, we have uh, a lot of capabilities and a lot of tools that we're able to use, but as, as I'm sure many people have, have covered, uh, AI and machine learning systems tend to work best or sort of most efficiently economically if you have large amounts of data, big data sets so that the systems can look for patterns. Um, uh, you know, Tracy was mentioning uh, anomalous trades, uh, you know, to have systems that are able to really dig into things, they need a large volume of, of information to draw from of sort of consistent um, or similar transactions to sort of to learn from that. So where you would tend to see our AI systems and our machine learning systems um, more at the forefront would be sort of external abuse fighting things that I, I think most people would be familiar with, um, such as for those of you who use Gmail, there is, you know, very sophisticated systems that um, protect our users from things like phishing and spam and malware. And that's something where people are always sort of adapting and trying to find new ways to, to you know, engage in sort of malicious conduct. And there's very high volume of data, lots of users. And so that, that provides an opportunity for our systems to really sort of learn from that. And, and it's something that we, we very actively use to protect our users. Um, on internal investigations, which my team tends to work on a bit more, we tend to not have as much data involved. It, it could be a very sort of, uh, you know, take an HR related investigation, for example, we may not need to look at really any data. We may just interview people and, and talk to people to figure out what happened. Um, and then there's, there's obviously some investigations or responses to regulators that will require review of, you know, more significant amounts of data like email or, you know, documents or things that we're all familiar with. And in those cases, I'd say that we, we, we do actively use technologies um, to try to narrow, you know, the scope of what we're looking at to really focus in on what's most important. Um, but because, you know, those are smaller investigations, less data, we may not have like an AI system or an ML system that we would use in that setting. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, Brett, on on the investigations do, that you do, um, are you using the AI on pretty much all of the investigations? And on what kind of data? I mean, has there been a change in data that you've seen over the years that you're focusing on with respect to your tools and your data analytic tools? Yeah, thanks, Nikki. We're seeing a very similar similar observations as Nick. What we're seeing is in the our investigation practice at FTI Consulting that in the way I like to refer to it is big data is the fuel for artificial intelligence. And if you don't have that fuel, then our artificial intelligence engine is not going to work. And so we really like to understand the contours of circumstance. If there's big data involved, then we'll, we'll get artificial intelligence and, and the applications that use it involved. But if it's a narrow um, type of investigation or there's a limited amount of data, in those circumstances, it, it just doesn't make sense to use some of the tools that are out there because it's, it's, it's the wrong tool for the circumstance. Mm -hmm. And have you seen a change when you go in to do an investigation over the past five years or so, have you seen a, a change in the type of data that you're, that's coming to your attention that you need to then, then collect and review and deal with? 
Yeah, in years past, you know, the, the data that we would, would primarily deal with would be email, accounting records. Those would be sourced from file servers, backup drives. And, and those, as you can expect, those are those are continue to remain active data sources. However, today, when we get into an investigation, we really understand the specifics of it and work with counsel and sit down and figure out a targeted approach. Often, we'll have to get into cell phones or voicemail, or just most recently, there's these collaboration um, platforms like Slack. And those are some new, more unique areas to grab that data, understand how they were being used in internal chat um, information was being used in the organization and source that. Mm -hmm. And and can you tell us about some of the new tools that you've been using in your investigations to deal with this type of data? Yeah, most recently, uh, Brainspace and Cura are some tools that that are being used um, in investigations that have artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities. And they've really contributed significantly recently in some investigations. And just to, just to touch on each, uh, Brainspace, you know, it does a really good job of taking a lot of data, specifically email data, and combining it into a visual where we can understand patterns and relationships in the data and identify things with respect to the, to the allegations at hand. And an example is, is recently there's an um, investigation we're working on is an FCPA investigation that was the original allegation um, when the uh, brain space tool was used and we got a visual understanding of the data and the communications lines going on the, the investigation quickly piv pivoted away from an fcpa investigation actually to an embezzlement scheme and without brain space we don't think that would have ident been identified as quickly as it was and Brett, on that though, could you give us a look without obviously disclosing anything confidential? Is it possible to give us a little bit of a description of what that visualization was and how that visualization indicated to you that you needed to pivot the investigation? The visual the visualization tool within Brainspace really gives you a simple look at who's speaking, the amount of communication between those individuals. So in this particular in investigation, there was when that was displayed, we could quickly identify there were some unique communications going on that we wouldn't otherwise expect. And so that was that that was a thrust to the investigation to look specifically into those areas. Okay. And then there was another tool you mentioned that I, I forgot the name of it. Yeah, Cura is a tool that we've recently begun to use um, more and more, and it's a good tool for searching for text on contracts. And so I think this could be particularly helpful. As you know, Nikki, in the, in, in the Valley, there is a lot of investigations with revenue recognition, and there can be unique terms typically that is the focus of a revenue recognition investigation, you know, unique terms with a particular customer or type of arrangement with customers. And so this tool has a machine learning capabilities to it that once we start to identify contracts that are problematic, it takes that information and it searches through the records of contracts to identify similar types of contracts that, that merit further review. Wow, that's great. So Nick, inside Google, can you tell us a little bit about um, what's driving the adoption of the types of technology? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I, sorry about that. I don't know what's going on with the audio, but anyways, I apologize. <laughs> what's driving the adoption of the kinds of technologies that um, Brett's talking about? Sure. Uh, so speaking about investigations and um, you know, even potentially in the litigation scenario, there's there's always a balance that I think you know, as I was saying earlier, I think it's going to depend on the nature of uh, the concerns that we're looking into, um, what the topics are. There's there's other things to consider. Um, what region is this uh, activity taking place in? What are our employee privacy rules in those jurisdictions? So there's a lot of sort of threshold questions that we have to consider about, you know, how deep we go on an investigation or, or what we might do. Uh, but then turning to the question of the technology or what um, sort of resources we might sort of bring to bear in those investigations. You know, again, I think there are there are reasons that we might hesitate in certain circumstances. We may say, you know, the volume of data is not high enough that would sort of require us taking this extra step. We don't want to delay the investigation. And we, you know, we have a set of emails we could just review. Uh, 
we have if it's something that we're responding to a regulator or if it's you know potential litigation we're going to want to know how the regulator or the other parties or the court or whoever we're dealing with is going to feel about our use of that technology because we don't want to go down a path of sort of adopting uh, a certain you know way of culling data that's going to turn out um, you know is not going to be well received by by who we're who we're working with um, so that's certainly something that we're going to want to consider as well. Um, for more sophisticated systems, I think we we consider things like model explainability. Like if we were to analyze data through a very sophisticated model and it spits out a series of documents or data or whatever, how are we going to be able to to explain how those choices um, were made by you know our systems? And so we want to make sure that we'd be able to communicate that. But at the same time, we would certainly consider using technologies in a lot of situations. Obviously, we want to be as efficient as possible if we're talking about large amounts of data. Um, and if the, the circumstances are right, then we would we would look for really any way to sort of narrowly target what really matters. Um, in terms of you know compliance and sort of more proactive forward looking things, we would you know consider using technology to uh, to create signals in our systems that might flag potential issues that, you know, so that we can catch things before they become something else. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, it's sort of, it's always a balance. Um, and, you know, it's something that I think we would consider really on an investigation by investigation basis um, and, you know, be able to adapt as needed. So I'm gonna go back to Brett because we got a question. Apparently, I didn't drag enough details out of you regarding <laughs> brain space. Um, so um, maybe you could, um, I'm not sure how to get more detail, but I, I think the audience is actually very interested in um, the use of brain space and how exactly it works. And maybe some, maybe there's more con concrete examples that you could provide, uh, because it is actually fascinating when you think about having data and then ending up with a visualization of something. Yeah, and what BrainSpace really does through this artificial intelligence is it gives you a breakout of email traffic and, and different and relationships amongst data. And it gives you a sense of what's what I like to call what's underneath the hood. And it's maybe some things that you never contemplated. And so it gives you the type of information that's going on in, in email. And so one of the common things that's all um, often referred to as the old Enron database of email and data files. And when those are applied to a tool such as this, it gives you information with regards to what was the nature of communications going on between people, what were the topics and the volume of that information. So it can really direct an investigation into into areas that um, can get, give you some enlightening in, in terms of what was going on in turn inside the organization. So for example, if you, uh, is what you're saying is, um, and I know this is not the normal topic of an investigation, but if two employees were spending the day sharing information about different stocks, right? Mm -hmm. um, within a company and that's, they spent a significant amount of their time sharing information about, you know, stocks and whether something was a good buy or not a good buy that would show up in the brain space visualization. And that might be off topic, right? But something you'd want to focus on. Is that what you're, is that what exactly, you're saying, right? Exactly. It gives a wheel of information and topics that you can then go through as a team and understand the contours, as I like to call it, of the information within the organization. That's a perfect example of something that you wouldn't expect to be going on and that you'd want to have follow further follow-up on. Okay. I'm actually going to go back to Nick because we have a question for Nick. So, Nick, um, someone in the audience wanted to know whether Google, the data analytics tools, um, that you use in investigations, whether you have existing tools in place or whether um, you, Google builds its own tools? Uh, that's a good question. And I, I think it, it varies. I mean, we, they're on one end of the spectrum, you know, we have, our discovery team has relationships with vendors that most of you all would be familiar with. And, and so we can avail ourselves of, of those technologies. Uh, I think on the investigative space, there are uh, 
you know, we have our own internal systems. And, and so we can sort of, um, you know, impact putting in signals in place because we understand how, you know, the types of data that we really, we'd be looking for. So we're probably more able to tailor that. Um, and, you know, I think we're always looking for ways to, to come up with, uh, to, to new ways that we can sort of make our jobs more efficient and effective. I'd say by and large for the investigations that I've been involved in, it hasn't been sort of a specific new system that we've built for ourselves for investigations purposes. It's mostly stuff that I think people would be pretty familiar with. Okay, so Tracy, I'm gonna come back to you. We already talked about insider trading. I was wondering whether you could share with the audience other areas um, where the SEC is using artificial intelligence, data analytics tools to identify and then focus on potential you know, investigations with respect to misconduct. Sure, and uh, Nick reminded me that I, I forgot my disclaimer, which I have to give that the, the views that I share today are my own and do not represent the views of the commission or any of its staff. So with that said, um, yes, yeah, so there are a number of different ways that we use either you know, artificial, artificial intelligence, you know, sort of machine learning um, and, and data analytics. And um, on the one hand, you have sort of surveillance, which we talked about earlier, which is sort of like insider trading. Um, we also um, use it on sort of the risk assessment side. So we have to assess risk. So for example, um, in, our, um, in our OC group, we um, use data analytics to determine or help determine where um, we should focus our resources in terms of examinations um, that, that the commission, um, that the OC staff um, should conduct. We also use um, data analytics in, in other areas. So for example, 10Ks, 10Qs, um, we use data analytics to sort of review information, we take data from the 10 case and cues that are filed by issuers, and we use artificial intelligence to pull information out of those filings, disclosures, um, certain issues, for example, COVID-19, um, and not just the words, but in context. And how can we use that to determine, for example, if an issuer has had um, prior restatements, if there are certain disclosures that we're, that we're interested in, we use artificial intelligence to help us determine where's the, high, where's the risk that a particular issuer may, um, may be engaged in some kind of improper misconduct, should we focus on certain industries? Um, so that's one area. Um, and then I would just say that in general, um, not just in the, insider trading space, but just in terms of market manipulation, right? So um, there are lots of times when in situations where folks can engage in misconduct um, in the markets, they might be engaged in manipulating stocks. We will use artificial intelligence to look at how are people engaged in the market space, right? So um, how are they, maybe there are certain individuals who are engaged in um, sort of misconduct as it relates to thinly traded stocks. Um, and then there's one other area that I think that, that um, is important. And that is when, whenever someone is barred from the industry, whether it's a broker dealer who's barred, whether it's an officer and director bar, whether it's someone who's been barred um, from appearing or practicing before the commission, maybe as an accountant or as an attorney, um, all of that information is tapped, and we use artificial intelligence to scan, for example, filings, in case uh, who's, who's signing those. And we have internal systems that track people who've been barred. Um, and so we will use AI to pull that information together, search for individuals who may have been barred from our industry, but are coming up in certain filings, for example. Um, which lets us know, obviously, that they're still participating in the in the spaces that we need to be um, that we need to be further investigating. You know, I, I remember you, you previously talked about, and I think the audience would be interested in hearing about a specific example: Kerning, 
and how a the SEC uses um, AI to identify churning cases. Can you just talk about that just for a bit? Yeah, so so churning is um, is when a, a broker may um, execute a number of trades, um, numerous trades um, on behalf of a, a customer. Um, and in theory, they're receiving fees, commissions for executing trades. So sometimes you will get unscrupul unscrupulous vote, uh, brokers who might engage in executing a number of trades on behalf of their clients really to generate fees for themselves. And that's a difficult, that can be difficult to, to identify because right in the old days, you're having to look at the trades that are going through, you know, statements or um, looking at, um, at trading blotters. But what we're able to do now is use artificial intelligence to identify, again, anomalous trades by specific brokers um, that might suggest that they're engaged in, in a pattern of churning their customers' accounts. That's great. Okay, I'm going to turn to a topic that is unfortunately, I'll say near but not dear to many of our hearts right now, um, which is the pandemic. Um, so Brett, I was just uh, curious um, whether you have seen or you expect that the pandemic is going to have some kind of impact on the nature or the number of investigations um, uh, going forward. Do you have a view on that? Yeah, I do. We, I mean, we just, we're continuing to work on investigations. We're seeing that whistleblower lines are alive and well. Um, and I think that the turn down that this unfortunate situation with COVID's put us in, it's, it was an immediate, it was, it was, it hit everyone hard. It caused a, a lot of significant um, pressures um, on individuals, middle management and senior management. And so uh, my personal feeling is that we're going to see new um, whistleblower claims that have a different nature to them than we pre previously. And I might contrast that with, over the last couple of years, we've had a series of new gap put in place. Um, it was mentioned earlier on one of the one of the forums that 606 and the rules with variable consideration has come about, and that's has new judgments and estimates with it. And I, I won't be surprised to see whistleblower claims as people terminate or try to terminate contracts. There'll be there'll be pressure on if any of that variable consideration should have been recognized because there's some interpretations out there if a contract's ter terminable that variable consideration never should have been recognized. And so that's just an example of one area where there's been more judgments and estimates in the financial statements. And the recent events are gonna put a lot of pressure on people where they're not gonna to wanna to tear down or not continue to recognize that variable consideration because they're worried about a downsizing or a furlough. And so I know in, in, in speaking and in, in fielding calls from CFOs and controllers over the last month and a half, um, what I can, the picture I can paint is that gatekeepers right now are under a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure um, as, you know, sales organizations and divisions are trying to save their jobs because there's a downturn and they're getting, you know, pressure on them that if they don't, if they aren't break even or at least making money, they're going to be furloughed. They're putting pressure on those accounting estimates, trying to manage the P&L through the accounting department versus operations. And so I think you're going to see uh, whistleblower um, activity um, increase, and you know, and and that'll drive more investigation, especially if there's accusations against senior management contained in those. So, so Nick, talking about the pandemic and, and bringing it back to the use of data analytics, um, can you talk at all about whether the, especially with respect to the external threats, the nature of the external threats has changed, and that because of the pandemic and then the use of the artificial intelligence to adopt <laughs> in some sense to, to then go after, identify and cut off the external threats mm -hmm. uh, as a result of scams, et cetera, based on the pandemic. Yeah, and, and it's something that um, I, you know, is, is a bit beyond what my, uh, what my personal job focuses on, but I know that our company is working quite hard in, 
uh, to meet sort of any new threats or things that emerge um, in, in that area, particularly externally facing. And the example that I used earlier uh, was that, you know, for Gmail, for example, we um, are always sort of monitoring for phishing, uh, spammy messages, malware, uh, that type of approach where people are, are trying to take advantage of, of folks. And that's an area where I think there was an article that we posted just last month talking about the efforts um, that were undertaking there and where our, our ML systems are already adopting or adapting to threats that people are sort of trying to, you know, capitalize, unfortunately, on this on this terrible situation, but sending emails about COVID-19 or, you know, things of that nature. Um, and so, again, because of the, the, the volume of data that's sort of analyzed, uh, our systems and our engineers are already adapting to the signals that might pop up and, and things like that. Like, you know, you could think one example that I think the uh, the article mentioned was, you know, people attempting to impersonate coming from a, a source of, you know, authority or some kind of non-governmental organization or something like that so that people are tricked into opening their email. Well, our hope is that that email never gets to them. So, I, you know, I think it's something that, um, you know, our systems are already sort of designed to, to catch things like that, but they're adapting in real time. Right. I assume there's also, there must be scams going on with respect to all the loans, for example, that are, right, the loans yeah. and, right, and I assume that there's going to be um, phishing emails and that the AI will have to adopt to that and pick those up and people will, will be giving their personal financial information and be tricked into thinking that this is a bank, for example, that's giving them, um, you know, one of the government loans that are available, um, yeah. loans or grants available today. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's an unfortunate reality that any time we're in a, in a situation, you know, I guess this is an unprecedented situation, but um, there's always people looking to exploit a situation. And I think we can approach it using the same types of tools that, that we've used um, for other situations and, and sort of be able to adapt to it that way. Okay. So I'm going to turn to both Brett and Tracy, but first Brett, then Tracy, and talk about um, the, the use of either both, not just TAR and predictive coding, but TAR or artificial intelligence data analytics in an investigation and the client's resistance or acceptance to use it, and then how they plan to go in and convince the SEC that it was appropriately used and it was sufficient and adequate. And then I'm going to turn to Tracy and ask what the SEC is looking for when someone walks into their office to say we did an adequate investigation and we used all these data, an data analytics tools um, how do they go about trying to convince you and, and, and is it acceptable to the SEC, which it, it must be, and it must be coming more and more acceptable. So, Brad, I'll start with, with you. Yeah, I think there's just naturally more acceptance of artificial intelligence these days. And I think part of it is the self-driving cars and all the other areas in our life where we're seeing artificial intelligence being and machine learning actually being put in place and how much value it's providing. So when the topic comes up now with regards to an investigation and how it can be used and improve the investigation, I think people are more willing to listen and understand. And I think, frankly, it's, it, we've gotten to a point where there's so much data and the volume of the data is so large and there's so many different sources of data, like I talked about earlier, grabbing Slack data or grabbing email data, um, grabbing other forms of data like instant messaging. There's so much data to deal with that if you don't use some powerful method to go through it, you're never going to get through all the data in an efficient, effective manner. So I think people have been willing to embrace it. I think the key is understanding the contours of an investigation, the data professionals, the technology professionals, and the friends accounting professionals and counsel all getting on the same page. And I like to refer to each one of these investigations being a snowflake. They're all different in using the right tool for the circumstances. It's not just plugging in one tool every time to the same, you know, because you prefer that tool. You got to look at the circumstances, the contour of the case and really use the right tools. Right. And, and Tracy, um, is it the SEC's expectation that at the beginning of an investigation, um, assuming that 
uh, you know, uh, let's just say an internal investigation by an audit committee um, has advised the SEC that an internal investigation is ongoing and they're going to use, whether it's predictive coding or other tools um, that, for example, the ones that Brett has mentioned, is it the SEC's expectation that you'll be apprised of that up front? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, really what we're looking for in, in our investigations is um, an indication that whatever internal investigation was done, um, that there was a robust sort of process, methodology. Um, and so what we, what I look for in my investigations is an explanation of sort of the inputs, right? So the process that was utilized, um, sometimes companies tell us about whether it's predictive coding, but whether they've used some kind of um, artificial intelligence to identify high risk transactions, um, and other information. And what I'm looking for is, um, is an explanation of that process. How did you come up with that methodology? What did it yield? Sometimes we come back to the company and we ask them to search for other um, information or other data. Sometimes we have information. And so when a company comes in and they say, well, this is what we found, we may have information on our side that suggests that they've missed something. Whatever their process was that they utilized, they've missed something. Um, it's not a game of gotcha, um, but we do want, we do sometimes want to make sure that they are being robust in the process. And so we might, we might provide them with information and say, you know, to the extent it doesn't compromise our investigation, but say, look, we have certain information that suggests X. That didn't come up in whatever process you utilized. Can you go back? Um, and companies are, are, are usually willing to do that. Uh, we do understand that sort of just the nature of companies and how large they are and how much data is um, that you're talking about and how many employees around the world that you do have to rely on. We understand that companies have to rely on some type of sort of artificial intelligence in some circumstances just to capture the information in a way that's usable for us. Mm -hmm. um, the, the place where I've seen, just because you know, Bruce mentioned how I, I used to be um, an assistant um, for the FCPA unit in the San Francisco office, I still have FCPA investigations. And so where I do see um, companies utilizing um, artificial intelligence um, in my investigations is in that space, because you have, they're trying to identify, for example, with respect to their internal controls, they're trying to identify high risk countries high risk transactions, high risk, maybe distributors. Um, and so they're utilizing that technology to try to identify those um, on the front end. So when they come into us and they explain to us, um, maybe something was missed, maybe we're looking into something. At the end of the day, we wanna know what were your controls? And so if they're explaining to us, look, we did have controls in place that utilized artificial intelligence to identify these high risk areas, but maybe it missed X, Y, or Z, you know, the standard that we're looking at is, are your controls sufficient? Um, are they adequate? And so we understand that, that they use this kind of technology, but we want to just make sure that it's, it's robust and it's utilized in a way that's, um, that's really um, sort of providing comfort to us, that they really are focused on the controls um, in their organizations. So Nick, feel free to demur. I don't want to put you on the spot. But with respect to what Tracy was just talking about, mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether you can tell us about Google's use of artificial intelligence with respect to its compliance efforts and its controls in an affirmative way, as opposed to a backwards looking investigations way. Without being too coy, I can't really get too much into the weeds on that. But I can say that I think as you would expect, um, I think what Tracy explained was a very realistic view of you know what um, can you know what types of things we might consider, and when you're talking about uh, at a global company, there's there's certain areas that you know we know in the world you know everybody knows are going to be riskier. So I think there there are ways that you can sort of uh, fine tune your. Uh, your your controls and you know what you're sort of looking for proactively based on things like jurisdiction, region, risk level, types of uh, 
the type of issue that um, at, at hand in terms of, you know, are talking about transactions? Are you talking about employee conduct? There, there's, there's a variety of ways that I think that we attempt to um, sort of, you know, assess relative risk. Hopefully that wasn't too vague and coy. Well, but let me, for Tracy, I assume that when a company comes in um, and presents on an investigation and at the end talks about its use of data analytics, artificial intelligence in its compliance efforts, talking about its controls, that that's taken into account with respect to cooperation credit. In, in some yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We take that into consideration and that, that right, that goes to the full picture of the company's controls that they had in place. Um, so yeah. Right, I think I see Bruce and I don't know whether that's a signal that we are at the end of our panel. Um, but if it mm -hmm. is, I wanted to thank all the, the, the panelists uh, for joining us today. And of course, thank Bruce um, for sponsoring this event, which is always great. No, Nikki, thank you so much. Terrific job on a great topic. Um, our next session is the keynote by SEC Co-Director of Enforcement, Stephen Pekin, which will begin uh, at 1240 Pacific. Thank you again, panel. It was a great job, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.